Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Richard Fontaine. I'm the president of the Center for New American Security. And it's a real pleasure to welcome all of you here to celebrate the, the publication of Yoki Driesen's new book, The Invisible Front, Love and Loss in an Era of Endless War. Yoki, as uh, many of you know, is quite simply one of the very best national security journalists in America today. He's the managing editor of Foreign Policy. Uh, he has spent nearly four years on the ground in Afghanistan and Iraq reporting and spending most of his time embedded uh, in frontline combat units. He was before that a longtime reporter for the Wall Street Journal and has served as a contributing editor to The Atlantic and a senior national security correspondent for National Journal. But above and beyond all of these uh, illustrious journalism uh, accomplishments, uh, Yoki's readers, uh, which I think include most of us in this room, uh, discern in his writings a deeply human touch and a full appreciation of war's costs during and after the battle. In recognition of this, he's received the Military Reporters and Editors Association top award for domestic military reporting for his 2010 series on military suicide and the psychological traumas impacting veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan. At CNAS, we're privileged that Yoki wrote his book while uh, a writer in residence uh, at the center. And uh, during his year with us, we discovered that not only is he a world-class author, but also uh, a wonderful colleague and friend. His deep insight into the human side of war was vitally important into all of the thinking that we did uh, on our own uh, projects and writing. And it fully animates uh, the book that we're here tonight to celebrate. In The Invisible Front, he tells the story of the Grahams, a couple who suffered the loss of two sons, one to combat and one to suicide. In their grief, they turned to, towards service of their own and helped lead a drive to stem military suicide, and they embraced a cause that has become far larger than any individual or family. Yoki tells their story with his characteristic grace, and it's a book that deserves to be very widely read and appreciated. Now, if I've convinced you of that latter fact, you'll be pleased to know that books will be for sale. Uh, and you can uh, purchase them uh, after the uh, conversation uh, on stage and Yoki will be available to sign uh, your copies. Um, we are going to start the uh, proceedings this evening with uh, Yoki giving us uh, a, a brief uh, sort of synopsis and overview of the, of the book and then we'll go into conversation from there and then open it up to the audience uh, for questions. Uh, but it's my special privilege uh, and pleasure to introduce uh, Yoki Driesen. Thanks. Thank you all for coming. Uh, before I start, I want to thank Richard, thank some people in the back of the room, Jarrell Clay, uh, Kate Kidd, Phil Carter, Sean, F Sean, Nate Fick. There are a lot of people in the CNS family who made me feel welcome when I was guzzling free Coke Zero and trying to rustle up any food beyond the granola bars that were haphazardly sprinkled through the office to, to fuel a year of writing. But I'm very grateful to them for that time. I'm very grateful to all of you for coming. Uh, I look forward to talking to hearing your thoughts and your questions. Mark and Carol Graham, the family that are at the, the center of this book, had for a long time a Norman Rockwell type family. They had three children who were all extraordinarily close. Kevin, who was the middle child, was sensitive. He was sort of the perfect one who, when his parents would say do something, he would do it without hesitation, without thinking. Jeff, his older brother, was the more ambunctious one. He drank, he was very, very good with women. He was someone who was the life of a party. Kevin would follow into the party, but would sort of sit by himself in the corner. And then Melanie, who was their young sister, she was the one that they tried to look out for. Wherever they went in the world, the three of them were a single unit. They were the three of them against the world because like many military families, as so many of you know, they moved from base to base, from country to country, and have to rebuild a social network wherever they went. And for their two boys, they were patriotic in every sense of the phrase. They looked at their father, they watched him ascend from his early start in Kentucky to being a captain in Germany, to moving on to Korea, to moving and doing some tours in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. And to them, this was the highest honor. This was the highest kind of public service. And they both, they both wanted to do the same thing. So they went to the University of Kentucky. They went to the ROTC program, each one planned to be an officer. For Jeff, it was to lead men into combat. For Kevin, it was to be a doctor. It was to help, to try to help others. Flash forward a few years. 
Jeff is, a, is out. He was the older of the two. He's commissioned. He's getting ready to go to Iraq. His brother Kevin, a year younger, about to enter the final summer before he'd be commissioned and also enter the army. What no one in the family knew, because Kevin had always been smart, he'd always been funny, he'd always been just the sweetheart of the family, was that there was a, a darkness inside of him that he was trying very hard to control and, and failing. And he was diagnosed with depression, with clinical depression, and put on medication, which brought his mood down. But that summer, he thought, if I enter the military and they discover them on this medication, they'll kick me out. My career will be done before it starts, so I can't take it. And so he stopped taking it. And that decision sent him spiraling. After his death, his family found a to-do list that he had left for himself, most of which was banal, uh, do laundry, pick up food, and the last item was take toaster into the bathtub. But they didn't find this out till, till much, much too late. He and Jeff had always played golf. That was their sport. And they were supposed to meet one morning to play. It was going to be one of the last rounds before Jeff left to do his last bit of training and then onto Iraq. And Kevin didn't show up. And Jeff was wondering and looking at his watch and looking at his cell phone, and, and his brother wasn't there. So he called the apartment. He called his sister and said, Melanie, have you seen Kevin? And she hadn't. And she knocked on his door and didn't hear anything. And she opened the door, and she saw him hanging. He had hung himself in the ceiling fan. And at first, she thought it was a prank. She thought her brothers were just trying to pull one over like they had in the past. But then the horror set in, and she realized it wasn't. And that sent her spiraling, and sent Mark spiraling, and sent Carol spiraling. Mark thought, I can't serve in the army anymore. Carol thought, I may not be able to live anymore. She was suicidal. They pulled through, but just barely. A year later, Jeff, who by this point was an infantry lieutenant, was leading his men on a bridge, a mission to clear a bridge near Fallujah. It was an actual particularly part that I've spent time in that at that moment was one of the bloodiest, most dangerous parts of the entire country. Jeff was leading from the front. He was walking ahead of his men. And he saw something glimmering on the bridge. And he didn't know what it was, but something to him said, it's not good. And so he turned to the men behind him to say, stay back. And as he turned, the bomb blew up. It was an IED buried on the bridge. He died. His men didn't. So now the family has lost two sons. They find out that on his last mission, when he left the base, Jeff had on him in his wallet his brother's driver's license. And the parents said to themselves, they were so close in life, at least they're so close in death. And that was, that was how they tried to pull through. So now Mark and Carol face this question that I think to anybody in the room with children is probably a question maybe has been wondered now of, if you lose one child, how do you pull through? And if you lose two, how do you get out of bed? I mean, how do you find anything, anything that could fill that void? And at first, they thought they couldn't. They thought that this was the end for both of them. For Mark, the military's done. He thought, if only I had prevented Jeff from going to Iraq, he'd still be alive. If only I had said to Kevin, you don't need to do this, he'd not have taken himself off medication, he'd still be alive. But they decided there was still a way to go. Carol said to Mark one night, this is either a chapter in our life or this is the book. And they decided it would be a chapter. Mark came back. At this point, he's beginning to ascend higher and higher up, and he has more prominence, more power. And what he sees around him, and what we all know to be true, tragically, is this wave of people coming back with PTSD, with wounds that you can't see. This wave of people coming back who are beginning to take their own lives. And the suicide rate is rising and rising and rising. First in 2009, it hits and then goes past the civilian rate. Then in 2010, the difference continues to grow. Then on and on to where we are now, where more people have killed themselves than died in Afghanistan by a significant margin, where more people kill themselves every year than the year that preceded it. So this year, so far, it's about 350 people, many of them in the Army National Guard and the Army Reserve. So Mark came back, and this was what he was discovering. And what he found was that it wasn't just this clinical antiseptic term of stigma which is a real issue, I mean, it's the accurate phrase, but that there is something in the culture of the army that he saw, the culture of the base where he was in command of, Fort Carson, that had a callousness to it and a cruelty. In one particular case at Fort Carson, in the brigade headquarters, near where you would sign out to go see a doctor, someone hung up a sheet that said, I'm going to see a psychologist because A, I'm a coward, B, I'm soft, C, all of the above. And this wasn't there for a few hours as a prank, this was there for days. In another case, someone wrote a suicide note on their wall. Uh, thankfully, they were gotten into help before it was too late. But the army court-martialed him for defacing army property. So, so this was what Mark was, was finding. This was the stigma that he was finding. And meanwhile, he's seeing the suicide numbers tick up higher and higher and higher. So